Here we go. All right, welcome. It's one o'clock. Welcome to our 201 lab for this week. And by the way, it is our absolute last lab that we'll be having for this semester. So yay on that part, but sad on the fact that we're almost done with 201 and, and uh, I like having you. So hopefully, it's the nice thing about 201 is that typically you would then take 202 and then I have you for 202. So it's always sad when I have my 202 students leave and then I don't have them anymore. So, um, so anyway, okay, so two things that you'll need for today's lab if you're watching this um, later is your lab packet. So you need the very last page of your lab packet, which goes over, the, no, I always turn it the wrong way. The eye and the ear, the eye and the ear. And then you need um, exercise 23 and 25 in your lab manual, so here, is an I, the, the first information that we're gonna start with today. Um, when we're done with lab today, then we'll also do the Kahoot, <coughs> excuse me, the Kahoot for um, the test this week. So the test will open tomorrow, test number five over CNS and PNS will open tomorrow on the 22nd and you need to finish it by the 25th of so that's Saturday by 11.59 p.m. And then the lab practical will open on the 22nd as well. And then you will have until the 28th to complete that. And then you don't have any more lab things to think about. And you can just focus on getting the last um, lecture material learned. And then the um, um, that other last thing, the final. Oh, yeah. Imagine that. Okay. So I think that's all that I have to tell you. Um, that I was talking with people before you, before I started recording. So, um, okay, so let's just go ahead into our lab packet. So you're gonna wanna go to the pictures on page five, five, 352, which is this image right here. And then we'll just go ahead and get started. All right, so um, associated structures of the eye. So these are gonna be things that surround the eye, of course, that are associated with the eye but not part of the eyeball itself. So the first thing, palpebrae, is the term for the eyelid. So we have a palpebral fissure. We come over here, we have a levator palpebrae superioris muscle. So palpebrae are your eyelids. Okay, your, and typically it's this one. It's your upper eyelid, um, but this is still your eyelid too. Um, levator palpebrae muscle is, let me underline some things. Today. Okay, so um, eyelid is your palpebra. Pal uh, oh my gosh, you guys. Palpebra. Okay, and then levator, palpebrae, and superioris just means that it's your upper eyelid. And that's going to be this muscle right here. Now, if we take a look at the orbicularis oculi, if you remember, that's the one that closes your eye, so it acts like a sphincter. And so this would be the rest of it down here. So you've got orbicularis oculi here, orbicularis oculi here. And so it's gonna surround your eye, contract, close your eyelid. So the levator palpebrae superioris muscle is the one that opens your eyelids. And I had a student once that was born without levator palpebrae muscles. So her eyelids were really closed. I mean, just when you relax this, your eyelid's still gonna be fairly closed. And then, um, uh, um, so when, so her lids were really, like her eyes were almost closed all the time. And uh, she had been in class and I always wondered, you know, what's, why her eyes looked like that. And she would tilt her head back a lot to, to look at things. And then um, after um, she, ha she had to withdraw from my class for some reason, and then she came back. And when she came back, she looked different. And she said, oh, I don't have, I didn't have levator palpebrae muscles and, and now I had some surgery to pull my eyelids back. So, um, uh, so that's really interesting. It's just, you know, when we, when we have those special things. All right, um, conjunctiva. So we have this tissue, let me put it in a different color. Um, so we have this tissue that's gonna hook in underneath your upper eyelid and then it's gonna cover over your eye. Basically it's gonna come around like this go over the surface of the eye and then down around the other side um, called the bulbar conjunctiva or just the conjunctiva. 
Okay, so this is tissue, epithelial tissue covers over the surface of your eye to help protect it from bacteria that might be um, wanting to grow on the surface of your eye. Uh, sometimes we do have bacteria though that grow on the surface of our eye and then we get um, uh, pink eye. If you look down at the table um, on page 352, it's really good, has all of the structures there. So if you look at on conjunctiva, um, clear mucous membrane lines the eyes and lines and covers, actually I should say covers the anterior way of the eye. And then secretes mucus, lubricate the eye. Inflammation of the conjunctiva results in conjunctivitis, commonly called pink eye. So there you go. Now, here's the other cool thing about the conjunctiva. Because it curves up around here and comes down the other side, you can never lose anything in the back of your eye. So eyelashes, contact lenses, I don't care what, nothing is ever going to go back here because it's trapped by this sac, conjunctival sac right here. Now, I've lost a contact lens down in here when I used to wear soft contact lenses and it ball up in there and you, oh man, it took forever to get that sucker out of there. But it did not go in over the surface of my eyeball and, and then to the back. So you don't have to worry about that. Go ahead and tell your mom, I won't lose my contact lens on the back of my eye. All right, if we go to the next picture, not that one and not that one. This is the one that we want to go to now. Okay, so this is, <clears throat> um, so in this picture that we want to take a look at is the lacrimal gland. So that's this thing right here. Kind of looks like a salivary gland because it's kind of like that. And you'll notice that it has little excretory ducts right here. This is where your tears come from. And so these arrows indicate the direction that tears are going to flow over your eye. And then as they flow over your eye, then they're going to go into that um, lacrimal connect, um, canaliculus, well punctum, and then the canaliculus, and then it'll go into the nasal lacrimal duct, which then goes down here into your nose. Actually, it comes in your superior. It's actually, it comes in right there. But anyway, um, comes in, and this is why your nose runs, of course, when you cry, is because it's draining down that nasal lacrimal. Yeah. So, oh, it's Mr. Despain. So there is that. Thank you so much. You can say hi. Hi. They can't see you, but at least oh. they can hear you. Keep learning. Always learning. Thanks, bye. He brought me a soda. So nice. Okay. Now, what else? Okay. Um, nasal lacrimal duct. All right. Extrinsic eye muscles. So if we take a look at the next picture. Here. All right, so here are the extrinsic eye muscles. Last or yesterday, we were talking about the cranial nerves, and we saw that there are six extrinsic eye muscles that three cranial nerves go to uh, ocular motor abducens and trochlear nerves. Um, uh, <laughs> and so those are them, but you don't need to know their names, but they're there in case you care. So we have four rectus muscles, superior, inferior, lateral, medial rectus, and two obliques, um, superior and inferior oblique. But, and then if you care about how they move your eye and what innervates them, that's there for you too. But I don't care that you know that. <clears throat> Just that you have muscles that move your eyeball around. All right, so now we're gonna go on to page 355 and um, look at the eyeball proper structures with the eyeball. So this is what we want to look at. I'm going to go to this picture there. That makes it bigger. So let's go through all of these parts. Um, so um, I don't like red. Burgundy. We'll use, nope, that won't show up. We'll do blue. Okay. So hopefully you can see with blue. All right. So there are three layers to the eyeball. They are the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. So the sclera is this white of your eye. It's all the way back there, even along your optic nerve, and then all the way up here. And then when it gets to the anterior um, two thirds of or two fifths of your eye, this part right here, this is called the cornea, and this is transparent. And the cornea is the major structure 
for focusing light rays back here on the back of the eyeball where we're gonna um, be able to see from, which I'll talk more about in a minute. But um, I wanna show you something because it's very pertinent in my life anyway. Um, a disorder that affects your cornea, let me just put that down here, called, let's pull this up. So my daughter has this. Some images up. Um, I'll show you. Well, I just show you this. Hey, we'll look at all these pictures. Okay, it's kind of gross. <laughs> um, so my daughter has keratoconus, and what happens with keratoconus? If we look at this picture, you can see here is the normal curvature to the cornea. Here is her curvature to the cornea, and as her and so what happens is her cornea was growing faster. If we look at this one, oh, it's kind of blurry. Um, her cornea keeps growing faster than the rest of her eye. And so as it grows, the cornea actually thins. And um, there's a good picture that I've shown before of the actual thinning of the cornea. Here's just another picture of what the cornea looks like. Oh, this is it. This is the one I want. So here is a normal cornea thickness, pretty uniform along the whole the whole uh, edge of the cornea. But with keratoconus, you know, it's like stretching a balloon over something pointy. The balloon's going to get thinner over that pointy part. And um, and so she was running the. First of all, she couldn't. We couldn't correct her vision because. Um, her, her cornea was so bowed out like that, so cone-shaped. And then the second thing was if her keratoconus kept progressing, then we would not have been able to correct it and she would have needed a corneal transplant. So they would have had to cut off her cornea and then put on a brand new one. And we didn't want to do that. So we did a procedure called um, collagen cross-linkage. And I think there was one, something up here. Um, Okay, so maybe they'll show in, okay, so this is what, this, okay, this could have been my daughter's eye. I have a picture of her with her eyelid all kept open like that, and then what they were doing to it. So, so um, they scrape off some cells off of, some epithelial cells off of the top of the, um, off of the cornea, and then they add drops of riboflavin in ultraviolet light, and that takes the um, cornea, so the weak cornea, has very few linkages between the different layers of the, of the collagen fibers that are in the cornea. And then after the, the collagen cross-linkage, then it produces more linkages to stop the coning of her cornea. And um, what was really frustrating is that our, our health insurance did not want to pay for it. Um, because they said, well, it's kind of like an elective procedure and we don't really know that it's, it's still experimental, and, but that was wrong because the FDA has approved it like three or four years ago to do as common practice, common treatment for keratoconus. And um, uh, so I had to pay for it out of my pocket and then, um, and so, which was $3,000. And then, um, then my the her doctor had to write a letter of medical necessity, um, and it was really awesome because she basically reamed out the insurance company and said, "Look, if we don't do this, she's going to need a corneal transplant, and do you really want to pay for a corneal transplant?" And so then they coughed up the money, and and I bought her a car with it. So uh, anyway, that's uh, that's my daughter's issue, and so now we we have to be careful. We have to go in often to make sure that it hasn't progressed. So that was her right eye. Her left eye has keratoconus in it, but it's not, we don't need to do it yet because it isn't progressing. So we've, we've stopped the progression in her right eye, but we were supposed to go last week to the eye doctor. And of course with COVID-19, we couldn't get there. So I'm hoping that it's not getting any worse um, so that we would have to do it again or have to have a corneal transplant. But anyway, so there's my little story on a cornea. I always have to tell that. All right, the next one is the choroid layer. So in the choroid layer is um, very vascular right here. So there's all these blood vessels here in the, in the choroid layer so that they'll all nourish the layers of the eye. 
And then also all the fluid that's in your eye is also going to be generated from this choroid layer. So what, um, what are the parts of the choroid layer? First of all is the ciliary body. So this is the ciliary body right here. And the ciliary body has a muscle in it, ciliary muscle, so there's ciliary body. And then you know, I have ciliary muscle listed here. I think that's in another picture. So there's some muscle in there that is going to adjust the um, thickness of the lens. When we're looking at things far away, our lens is long and skinny. So we don't really use our lens much to focus our light rays. We use the cornea primarily right here. Um, but then when we're looking at things up close, we have to really bend the light rays a lot because they're really scattered and we need to focus them back here on the back of the retina. And so the muscles in the ciliary body will contract and they'll make the lens short and fat. And these little suspensory ligaments here will allow that as the muscle contracts like a sphincter again to, um, to make the lens short and fat. So that's why when you look at a, something that's far away, you can look at things far away, like watch a movie in a movie theater for hours and hours and hours, but yet if you tried to read a book for hours and hours and hours, your eyes are going to get tired because that ciliary muscle is doing the contracting while you're looking at things up close. Okay, so that's the ciliary body. Um, and the ciliary body, when we get to the fluids of the eye, then I'll, I'll tell you about um, how they get made out of the ciliary body as well. Okay, now, also from the ciliary, or from, this, from the choroid layer, sorry, is the iris. So here is the iris of your eye, and there's an opening in your iris called the pupil. All right, so the iris is the colored portion of your eye. I'm gonna go back to a different picture and just show you again. All right, so all of this greenish blue part in this eye right here, this is all iris, and then this black is not black. It's actually an opening, and so there's no light coming out, so that's why it's black. And um, so think about when you've seen pictures of people um, and they have red eye, it's because the flash was so bright that the, that the um, iris didn't have enough time to close the pupil to the point where the light didn't escape. So the light from the flash of the camera went into the eye, bounced off the back of the eye, came back out, and illuminated the back of the eye. So the back of the eye is actually an orangey red color, and, and so that's what we were seeing because that pupil hadn't closed down far enough to the point where the light didn't come back out. Um, okay. All right, um, just a minute. All right, so, um, all right, so that's the iris and that's the pupil. Let's go to this picture. All right, so this is good because this talks about the muscles that are in the pupil. I mean, in the, in the iris of your eye. So, so there are two, two muscles that are gonna be found here in the iris. And so there it shows the two muscles, the sphincter muscles and the dilator muscles. So the sphincter muscles go right around the pupil and they're gonna cause your pupil size to decrease during what's known as parasympathetic stimulation, which we'll talk about next week. Actually, no, we will talk about it at the end of this week. And then, um, actually starting tomorrow, we'll discuss that. And then we have dilator muscles, which are gonna pull back on the edge of the pupil and then make the pupil size increase during sympathetic stimulation. Okay, so we have the reflexes, bright light is gonna cause it to constrict and dim light's gonna cause it to, to um, dilate. But then we also have during sympathetic, parasympathetic, or parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulation will also act on those muscles as well. But we're gonna talk more about that in lab. I mean, in lecture, we are in lab. Okay, and then the, and then, oh, I skipped lens. Okay, so let's go to the lens, oops, the wrong way. All right, so here is the lens of the eye. It's made out of collagen again, but it's gonna be transparent just like the cornea. And again, depending on if we're looking at things up close or far away, when we're looking at up close, the lens will be short and fat. When we're looking at far away, it's gonna be long and skinny. We can take a look at a picture of that in here somewhere. Sorry. 
Okay, so here we are looking at things far away. So the lens flattens, the ciliary muscle, there it is, and the ciliary body relaxes. So he relaxes the ciliary muscle and pulling, flattening the lens. But when the muscle contracts, um, then the, um, bulge, the lens bulges and, um, and so it gets short and fat when looking at things up close. So far away, long and skinny, up close, short and fat. Um, we'll also talk about cataracts in a minute when we get to it. Okay, so we're back to here. Sorry, I went all the way like that. Um, so now we get to the retina. So the retina is the innermost portion of the eye. The retina is actually yellow, um, like it's shown right here. But when we look into the eye, the back of the eye actually looks kind of orange looking because, um, uh, it's reflected from the, um, from the choroid from the back. Hang on, don't go anywhere. I just gotta grab something. Geez, now somebody brought me lunch. I'm so lucky. Um, okay. Of course you didn't go anywhere. Where are you gonna go? Okay. Um, all right. Where are we now? To the retina. Okay, so the retina is going to have the, recept the receptors, the photoreceptors for light. And like I said, when we did um, light receptors, there's two kinds. One's for light and dark, and then one's for color vision. So those will be found here in the retina. And we'll look at those in just a minute. Actually, we'll look at them right now. Okay, so they are called rods and cones. We go to oh oh well, we'll get rid of the scribbled on. Let me get rid of the scribbled on still. Um, go. And so we're going to come back to that other picture, but we'll look at this one right now. So here is what the retinas look looks like. There's actually um, five different, actually there's more than that. Well, there's only about five. So ganglion and the amacrine and the bipolar, well, five, I guess. I guess there are five. Um, different kinds of cells that we find in the retina. <clears throat> the only ones that you need to know are the rods and cones. So light is going to come in. If we look at the pathway of light, light comes in and then it stimulates the rods, which are the purple rod-shaped things, and the cones, which are the yellow cone-shaped things. And then the signal will go back out and then into the nerves and go on into your brain. So the rods are the most abundant. You can see there are many more rods than we have cones in here, almost three times the number of rods that we have cones here. Okay, so rods are for light and dark vision. Cones are for color vision. Um, and so when the light comes into your eye, it's going to reach a spot back here. So let's draw the pathway of light. Okay, so light's gonna be coming into your eye. And when it goes through all of the parts that are going to bend the light rays, I didn't do that very well. Let me um, do that again. Okay, so then when the light comes in, ooh, I didn't draw that very well. It's gonna pass right through here, and there we go. Now I made it fall where it's supposed to go. And it's gonna fall on a spot called the fovea centralis. So the fovea is this dip right back here in the back of your eye. And let me answer this question really quick. Um, 
Okay, so Annette asks, are the cones different for people with colorblindness? It's actually a deficit of cones with people with colorblindness. And there are various types of colorblindness that we have. And um, uh, it depends on which cones, because there are three different kinds of cones. There are red, green, and blue cones. So depending, um, uh, depending on um, what inheritance you got, then you can have various degrees of colorblindness, different shades, different colors that you can't see, or you may be total colorblind person because you don't have um, any, um, any cones at all. So that's how colorblindness works. And we'll talk more about that when, when we actually discuss them in lecture. Um, all right. Okay, so now the light, <clears throat> all the light rays of the color vision are going to fall on the fovea centralis. And this is the only place, the fovea and the macula lutea, which is a little circle outside of it, that's the only place that we have cones. The rest of our eye is all um, rod. <coughs> oh my goodness. I say choke. It's all rods. So this is why if at night you are looking at something, like say you're looking at a star, for example, you kind of have to look off to one side or the other, it's called averted vision, to actually see that star the best because the light coming in is, you know, mostly just light and dark um, light rays and um, you can't pick it up. And so uh, it's also why at nighttime, when you're walking through the house and there's no color, things tend to be a little blurry because again, there's no, um, light color that's falling right there on the fovea to give you really sharp color vision, okay, or really sharp vision. So there's the fovea and then the macula lutea is there on the outside, okay, and cones are only in those places and not on the <clears throat> anywhere else, and so there are no rods there either. Now, right here is the optic disc called your blind spot. So this doesn't have any photoreceptors at all. And so if light were to fall on the on that, <clears throat> then um, you wouldn't see anything at all. So there is a, uh, a little activity on page 364 in your lab manual on demonstrating the blind spot. So if you follow the directions on there, <clears throat> you can actually have that black dot disappear because you're going to focus either your left or your right eye one at a time. Um, on the X and then the, uh, the um, dot will disappear. So at a certain distance away from your eye because that's where the rays from that eye are fall falling. Um, I heard that you can only see color in your straight view and our brains fill in color. Um, yeah, and so your brain will fill in. So let's say that you're doing um, that blind spot experiment the black dot will disappear and your brain will fill it in with green background because that's what it sees all the way around. And yes, because the color in your straight view is due to the fovea, the light rays falling on your fovea, then anything else is, is like you said, your brain filling in color because your brain doesn't like an absence of stuff. And so it just kind of fills in with what it thinks is around. So that's why your peripheral vision is not as acute as your straight on front vision, um, because because sometimes it's just like okay an estimation, and then that's part of the reason why you guys your eyeballs are always moving around. Even though you think they're straight on, there's subtle movements back and forth. Why you have to have um, fast glycolytic muscles in your eye? Why the why the twitch is so short? in your eye muscles is because you always got to move your eyeballs around so that you're always picking up what it is around you. So vision is crazy, you guys. It's, I, I'm amazed that we can see like we see and then, and then how do we do that? And then whole evolution of the eyeball. Oh my gosh. Um, just, it's crazy as you go from, from organisms that aren't sighted to organisms that are, Oh my gosh, it's just amazing how that happened. So just, you know, throw that out there. 
I believe it had to be directed, didn't just happen by accident. So there's that for what it's worth. Okay, now um, chambers of the eye. So we've got two chambers of the eye. We have the anterior or segments, actually that, oh, there it is, anterior segment. I was going, it's supposed to be a segment. So here's the anterior segment. <clears throat> That's gonna be between the lens and the inside of the cornea. And then we have a posterior segment that is gonna be from the lens to the back of the eyeball. Now, um, there are fluids in both of those. Let me get rid of all my mess. Okay, there's, so there's fluids in all of these, in these two chambers. Um, the, the anterior segment has aqueous humor, which is watery, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And then the posterior segment contains vitreous humor, which is gel-like. So you can see, oh, okay, it's kind of like gelish. So here is, <clears throat> in this next picture, um, here you can see the, the vitreous humor is this jelly-like material, which you can't really see the fluid that's in the anterior segment. Um, if you are familiar with what you do when you get poked in the eye, you probably know that you need to leave the object that you got poked in the eye with, you need to leave it in your eye, don't pull it out. And the reason why you have to leave it in your eye is that if the um, um, vitreous humor drains out, oh, dang it, then, um, then you won't be able to see again because you won't be able, to, we can't give you new vitreous humor. So your eyeball will deflate and then and that'll be it. You won't be able to see out of that eyeball anymore. Um, so leave that in so that it doesn't dry out or doesn't drain out and then we can, um, we can have uh, um, professional ophthalmologists repair your eye, make sure that they can get that object out there without losing the intraocular pressure. Okay, um, let's see. So what else do I need to tell you? Um, oh, I was gonna show you where it gets formed from. So the vitreous humor, I mean the aqueous humor on the other hand, um, is gonna come here. So this, this diagram shows you uh, where the aqueous humor gets made. So it's made here in the ciliary processes of the ciliary body. And so it's gonna come out here in front of your lens, pass through the, through the uh, uh, pupil here, and then it's gonna come down into the anterior chamber or the anterior segment, and then down into this, these little openings here in the cornea called the scleral venous sinuses. And so what is gonna happen there is that the fluid is gonna drain out. So it's constantly being made and constantly being recycled and removed from your eye. Um, and so some of you may have, if you've been to the eye doctor and you had, um, dang it, and you had a puff of eye, I mean a puff of air test on your eye, and they blew that, you know, and you really hate that. Well, that's what they're doing is measuring how much aqueous humor or the intraocular pressure. And if that pressure is high, then you have something called glaucoma. And the, um, and the uh, pressure isn't, I mean, the fluid isn't draining out like it should. And my mom had glaucoma for like, a long time and she'd have to put drops in her eyes to stop it from being high. And then finally they just said, okay, um, you don't need um, to use the drops anymore. So your glaucoma has gone away. So that was nice. Oh, this is really annoying for her to have to do that every day, twice a day. And she got up in the morning when she went to bed at night. Okay. All right. So I think that's everything then on the eye. Um, oops. This graph just shows something we'll do in lecture. Let me just go through this real quick. Yeah, we're not, well, everything else we'll take a look at in lecture. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna go on to the ear. Oop, dang it. Let me find my ear pictures. Smell, taste, ear, there we go. 
All right. So um, here we have the structure of the ear. And it's got three regions to it. We have the outer ear. So here's the external ear, the outer ear. We have the middle ear and the inner ear. The external ear has this large, oh, excuse me, large fleshy cartilaginous structure there called the pinna or the oracle. Either one is fine. You'll notice they put oracle and then pinna, and I put pinna and then oracle in parentheses. It's just whatever you're used to. Then we have this opening that will funnel the sound from the outside into your middle ear called the external acoustic meatus. We saw that on the skull when we did the bones of the skull, the structures of the skull. Now inside of the skin, you can't actually see it, and all this blue is all the cartilages within your ear. Um, but in the skin will be ceruminous glands. So ceruminous glands are wax, what produce earwax, so they'll be in there. The reason why we need earwax is that if water gets in here, we don't want it to pull down in the, uh, the eardrum or the tympanic membrane um, and, and cause inflammation. Some of you may have already had that before in your life. It's called swimmer's ear, where you got too much water in your ear and then it caused the, the canal to be inflamed. And it's really painful, especially when you're moving your jaw because this is where your jaw inserts is right here. And so even moving your jaw up and down can be very painful. My son had it. Um, swimming too much, obviously. Um, we also don't want little creatures living inside of your ear. So we, we have this cerumen so that they can't set up residence inside of your ear canal. All right, and then the, the boundary between the outer ear and the inner ear or the wall that separates the two is the tympanic membrane or your eardrum, okay? So external ear goes up to the outside of the tympanic membrane and then the middle ear comes up and meets the tympanic membrane, produces the inside. So there's actually two layers to the tympanic membrane and they form independently of one another. You dip in from the outside and then you come up from the inside and, and then those two sides seal together and they, and they make the tympanic membrane. So it's really so interesting. How you came to be is the craziest thing ever. All the parts that had to come, get, come together and form in different ways is just, astounding to make the beautiful incredible creatures that you guys are today is just it's just awe-inspiring i took embryology class last semester and wow it was it was nuts okay um so then we go to the middle ear and the middle ear is made up of three bones the malleus the incus and the stapes so the first um of the ear bones the one that comes in is touching the tympanic membrane is the malleus and then the malleus is going to touch the incus and then the incus is going to touch the stapes and these three bones are inside your middle ear for amplifying sound which i'll get to in just a minute all right then we have an oval window which is right underneath the foot plate of the stapes so there's a little depression right there so you can see oval window deep to stapes is a depression right there and i'll show you where it comes out on the other side here in just a minute and then we also have a round window. So as sound goes into our inner ear, then the sound has to come back. The vibrations have to come back. That's kind of like a little pressure release valve. And so as that pr pressure goes in through here and then comes back out, it's gonna bulge out the round window. Um, we also have this um, eustachian tube, I don't call it that, auditory tube or pharyngotympanic tube that's gonna go down into the pharynx above your nose, well, behind your nose, so um, called your nasopharynx. And this is what causes your ears to pop when you change in elevation. So why do we need that to happen? Why do your ears pop when we change in elevation? Let me show you. So, um, let's do green. Let's see green a little bit better. All right, so when you're um, outside right now, or wherever you are right now, atmospheric pressure is pushing in on your tympanic membrane, but you also have pressure from your nasopharynx coming up air, coming up here, 
pushing on the other side of the tympanic membrane. Okay, so push it in that way. And then pressure from the outside is pushing on that way. And it's equal right now. But if you were to suddenly change elevation, so if you were to go up in an airplane or even go up on the mountain, what's gonna happen is that this pressure here is going to decrease. So it's not gonna be as strong pushing in as the force is pushing out until you equalize the pressure. So how do you do that? Well, you yawn, you swallow, you plug your nose and blow, whatever you happen to do um, to equalize that pressure. So what you have to do is clear out any fluid that might be in there to allow the air pressure to equalize. So um, babies have a hard time. I don't know if you've ever flown on a flight with a baby or when there was a baby on your flight and they, and they have a hard time and they cry and, and they're miserable. And when we flew to Europe, my daughter was six. Um, every time we landed, so we had to fly to Denver and land and then fly to London and land. And uh, both of those times, she was just absolutely miserable in landing because she couldn't get her ears to pop. So she just cried and cried and I felt so bad for her. But anyway, okay. So that is the purpose of the auditory tube. Oh, now one more thing. Um, what about when people get tubes in their ears? What does that mean? Well, I'll talk about why do people need tubes in their ears. So um, say that you have frequent sore throats or some kind of upper respiratory tract infections, strep or whatever. The bacteria can start moving from the back of your throat and they, and they do in a little circular motion. No, they don't. I don't know why I'm drawing it like a circle. The colonies start creeping up the auditory tube until they take up residence in this middle ear or middle ear cavity, and um, and so this is when you have a full blown ear infection. So the doctor will take a look at your ear and and see, be able to see that this tympanic membrane isn't transparent anymore. Uh, I had a friend, oh, I still have this friend, but he had a bad middle ear infection that really wasn't bothering him as far as pain too much or he wasn't getting a fever or anything like that. <clears throat> but when he changed elevation, then it hurt really, really bad. And he went to Prescott to, um, to the basketball tournament. And um, while he was there, his eardrum ruptured and all of this infectious material and blood and pus and stuff all just poured out his ear. And so I have a picture of what his ear what your ear is supposed to look like, what his good ear looks like, and then what his bad ear looked like. Um, so how can we prevent that from happening? Well, you can't stop infections from happening, you know, maybe in your nose. Um, and so the stuff is gonna still keep up, keep growing in here. So what do we have to do um, when we have our ear infections, if we have too many of them? Well, we're gonna put a tube through the tympanic membrane out to the other side. Now the tympanic, this is bad angle because it's kind of like coned like that, but it's just thin like paper. So we're just gonna put a hole through the tympanic membrane and put a tube to reinforce it so that now the material can drain out and it doesn't keep building in the back of your ear. So um, that's what's happening when kids get tubes in their ears. All right, okay, so that's that to the ear that part of the ear. So now we want to go to the inner ear. So that's this thing that we call the labyrinth. And so why do we call it the labyrinth? Because it was a really cool movie with David Bowie in it. No, I mean, it is a cool movie with David Bowie in it. But <clears throat> so if you haven't seen labyrinth before, it's, it's an experience, friends. Go find it on Netflix. I don't think it's on Netflix right now, but try to find labyrinth somewhere. It's at my house if you want to come see it. All right. So all of this is the labyrinth and a labyrinth is a maze. So this is kind of twisty and curvy and stuff. And so uh, whoever looked at it first went, oh, that looks like a labyrinth. So we decided to call it the labyrinth. All right, so the labyrinth has two parts. It has a bony part, it has a membranous part. So if we look here at this brown part, okay, this is all bone right here. 
Yeah, this is hard for me to draw around it. Okay, so it's all bone right here. And up in here and around all the semicircular canals. So all the brown stuff is the bony labyrinth. And then all the blue stuff is the membranous labyrinth that's inside. So it has the exact same shape as the outside. It's just made of a membrane in star, instead of a, uh, instead of bone. And so that's the difference between the bony and membranous labyrinth. Now there are fluids inside of your ear. So we're going to take a look at this picture. What we're going to do is straighten out the labyrinth. We're actually straighten out the cochlea, which is this curved part. All right. Um, there's just a cross section through it. So, you know, if you took a cinnamon roll, and you cut through a cinnamon roll, this you would see, you know, different folds within your cinnamon roll. And it would be, where's the picture I want? Okay, this is the picture that I want. All right, so this is the hearing part. Well, the, the fluid's gonna be in all of the parts between the bony and membranous all the time, but um, it's easier to show you on this picture. And then we'll go back to the rest of the terms on our list. All right, so um, paralymph then is the fluid that's found in the bony labyrinth. So um, the bony labyrinth is going to be between here and here. And where does it say paralymph? <clears throat> huh, it doesn't. Okay, but there is paralymph inside of here. And it's just fluid. It's just like blood plasma is all. So there's paralymph in the bony labyrinth. And then inside of here, this is the membranous labyrinth. Let's pick a different color. Let's do yellow. Okay, so then this is membranous labyrinth in here. And this is going to be endolymph in this tube. So in a minute, we're going to look at another view. We're going to look at a cross section through here so we can see what it looks like um, in, the, in the cochlea, but we're not gonna go there yet. So let's go back. There's this cut through the cinnamon roll. So we just took those two tubes, so we have paralymph and endolymph, so the bony labyrinth, membranous labyrinth, and we just coiled it up on itself. So if you cut a piece of pie, shape out of a cinnamon roll, you would see it exactly the same as this. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, let's go to the vestibule and the, and the semicircular canals. So here are the semicircular canals. There are three of them. One, two, three, posterior, anterior, lateral. And real, what they are is just, um, uh, oh, well, actually it's where we get balance from. Okay, so um, there's going to be fluid in there that will move around. We'll talk about it in, in our lecture, but um, uh, fluid moving in there will help us be aware of our, the position of our head as in our body as we're spinning around. So, so this is going to be like a gyroscope, how we know where we are when we're spinning. So three semicircular canals. The ducts are just the blue part. The semicircular canals are the brown, the bony part. I'll just call them semicircular canals is fine. Okay, the vestibule is this portion that the semicircular canals are attached to. So let's go back to this picture. So here are the semicircular canals. Here's the vestibule down here, and it's going to go all the way down to where the round window is. I have all the window and round window vestibule into the cochlea. So um, the vestibule is where we have um, nodding our head up and down or moving our head from side to side. Uh, we'll detect that movement here in the vestibule. So these two places, saccule and utricle, um, are for, or I did them backwards, utricle and saccule, are for um, moving our head up and down and side to side. Now notice, so if you remember, um, cranial nerve number eight, where it goes to our ear, there's going to be a vestibular part and a cochlear part. 
So this is the vestibulo part. So it goes to the vestibule. So this is the part of the nerve that's for balance. And then the cochlear nerve is the part that goes to cochlea for hearing. So these two babies together, vestibulo cochlear nerve, then as they go into your brain, produce the vestibule cochlear nerve. And then right and right along on the top of them is the facial nerve. Um, but it doesn't participate in hearing. Okay, then um, let's go to the parts of the cochlea. So we're gonna look at this cross section again because this is where we hear from. So if you notice in this first view, this first picture, like I said, they cut a pie piece out of the cochlea to show it just, it's the same thing. Here's the cochlear nerve with just all these different parts, these different branches going to different areas. And I'll tell you why they have to do that in a minute. And then um, if we take a look at this, actually, let's go back here. That's one of these pictures right here is this view right here. Okay, so there's three parts to a cochlea, and then I'll show it to you in another way. So we have the upper chamber. Notice that it says contains paralymp. So this is in the bony, ooh, look it, see, all bone. It's all surrounded by bone. It is the um, scale of vestibuli with paralymph in it. Here is surrounded by membrane. So this is membranous labyrinth. This is called the cochlear duct or scalar media, and it has endolymph inside of it. And then it also has this little structure called the spiral organ, which we'll get to in a minute. And then the bottom chamber is again in the bone. So this is bony labyrinth. And this chamber down here at the bottom is called the scala tympani, also contains paralymph. Um, the bottom of the scala vestibuli is called the vestibular membrane. And then the top of the tympanic membrane, I mean, the top of the scale tympani is called the basilar membrane. Okay, so here's the basilar membrane, here is the vestibular membrane. And then we have the spiral organ. Now, the spiral organ contains the structures for hearing. So let me make a box around the whole spiral organ. Because this, this um, leader line is a little misleading that it just points to a cell. And so you think, oh, okay, that's just a cell. If you look on 376 though, your picture in your book, it does box it out. So the spiral organ, or we used to call it the organ of Corti, is actually everything that's contained within the box. So what's in the box? Let's go to what's in the box. All right, so here are the parts of the box. And so all of these structures will be involved in hearing. And they're in the cochlear duct. Okay, so the first thing is that we have some hair cells. <clears throat> and these hair cells have little hairs on them, obviously. And we have some supporting cells. We're not going to worry about those. But we need to see that the cochlear nerve, fibers of the cochlear nerve, so these are all axons, sensory nerve axons, going to each one of these hair cells. Now, when sound comes into our ear, I'm going to have to go to a different picture, and then we'll get the story of what's going on. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna do pathway of sound, how we pick up sound, and then we'll go back to all what's happening specifically in the organ of Corti. Okay, so as you're listening to me right now, there's a particular pattern of vibrations that's being set up by my voice and what I'm saying, and then it will set up a, you know, a pattern of waves that will strike the tympanic membrane, that will start the malleus vibrating, that will then start the incus vibrating and the stapes vibrating. And then those vibrations will go into the oval window and then start vibrating the paralymph here in the scale of vestibuli. And depending on the pitch of my voice, so, so right now, I don't know, I'm probably somewhere up here. So if you think about um, if you play a stringed instrument, so we're just gonna make a little, um, guitar or violin or something. Okay, so 
here is my <laughs> strange looking. I don't even know. Looks so bad. Okay, so you have strings coming down over the hole where the sound is. All right, so with sound, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the pitch. So what creates the wavelength? Well, it's how long the, the strings happen to be. So you know if you just pluck a, a string on a guitar or on a violin, that that's going to be the lowest note that you can produce with that string. And then if you move down this way, if you pinch off the string, especially get up here, the pitch increases. The pitch gets higher and, and because the frequency increases. And so um, the higher the pitch, the shorter the length here, and the lower the pitch, the longer the length of the string. So we want to use that principle here in the organ of corti, or in the cochlea. So as you listen to a particular pitch, however high that pitch is, that's where it's going to start vibrating along the basilar membrane down here. So let's say we're listening to something super high pitched, you know, like a high pitched buzz uh, from the computer or something like that. Okay, that sound will only go to there. So it gonna, it's gonna come in and then it's gonna dip down and just vibrate that much of the, of the uh, basilar membrane. And so those hair cells that are in here, so let's say these are the fibers that are going to them. Okay, those fibers will come in, they'll get stimulated, and then they'll go back to your brain as a high-pitched sound. But if I want to listen to something very low, like a didgeridoo on, in SpongeBob or something, then those low notes have to, well, they're going to come in this way. They're going to go all the way down here and then come back. And so these nerves right here are those um, axons. Then when they go back to your brain, they let you know that you're listening to a very low pitched sound. And so the sound will come in, then it's going to come back out through the round window. So it's going to go in through the oval window. It's going to cut through from the scala vestibuli, cochlear duct, and scala tympani, and then vibrate the basilar membrane wherever the pitch is, like keys on a piano, and then the sound comes back out through the round window. So now let's go to back to, oh, well, let's just look at this one. Let's go forward. And so this will give you an idea. So this is where the deflection is. So high pitch sounds displace the basilar membrane near the base and near the round window or the oval window where it came in. Medium sounds, medium frequency sounds. So middle range sounds would be somewhere near the middle. And then the lowest pitch notes would be way out here. Long floppy fibers, short stiff fibers. Okay. Now, what is that doing in our organ of corti? Well, depending on what the pitch is, whoops, depending on what the pitch is, okay, so maybe this is where that pitch is picked up. The vibrations in the paralymph down here, so remember this is paralymph, this is endolymph right here. They, those vibrations are gonna start making, pushing up against the basilar membrane, and the basilar membrane is gonna push up these hair cells. So it's gonna vibrate up and down, just in this area with this pitch of sound. Now, what that will do is cause the hair cells with their little hairs to strike another membrane in the cochlear duct right here called the tectorial membrane. So now as those hair cells hit the tectorial membrane, that deflects them, bends them that way, and then that sends, creates an nerve impulse because um, they're, remember, with, with uh, mechanoreceptors like sound, it's a displacement of the cells. So we just displace the hair cells or the little hairs on the top, and then that will cause an action potential that will go down the sensory neuron, and then it'll go back to your brain. So that's how hearing works. I know it's kind of complicated, but, um, but that's what happens. Okay, and so we'll spend more time talking about it when we get to... Um, um, it in lecture. All right, so that's everything. So those pictures that we've looked at then are all in your lab manual. And um, between exercise 23 and, and exercise 25, uh, so study those.
where they are and know that you will have lots of questions from this week's lab because we haven't had a quiz on this. So we'll have at least 10 questions, maybe a couple more on the lab practical from that. Then um, from the rest of the labs, we, we have things we can cross off. I'll make you a list of cross offable terms and then I'll post that in the announcement so that you know what you don't have to study for the lab practical. Okay, so before we leave the lab stuff and, and do the Kahoot, is there any, are there any questions that anybody has? I'll wait while I'm clearing this. Okay, well, if nobody has any questions, then we'll go ahead and Kahoot. So, um, All right, so let's play. Come on, there we go. All right, so there's our code. If you wanna play along, somebody's gotta play or else then we don't record this. I know if Camilla's here, she'll play. And, and the upside down happy face pineapple people. <laughs> Yay! McDonald's. And puppies and a little scared person. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> This is actually a pretty easy exam because um, you just have to go through, you know, what each part does, what each part is responsible for. So it's really not that bad. Yay, there's Camilla. I knew you'd play if you could get in. All right. I don't know that we had too many more. Annette, I bet you're the pineapple girl. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh, I just lost somebody. I lost the poor little sad face person or scared face person. But anyway, try to get back in. Okay, here we go. Oh, there you are. You came back. Yay. Okay, which of the following embryonic tissues develops into the adult brain? We just did this this morning in um, 202. Talked about it in good detail. Oh, that was fast. Ectoderm. So remember, ecto means on the outside. Because remember, your back dipped down and then it pinched off and then the neural tube dropped into the back. So. Make sure you know the ectoderm, the tissue on the outside, is what develops into the nervous system. All right. Okay, next one. Why are the convolutions and folds present in an adult brain? So, Jai Ryan Sulkai. I like because it looks pretty, but. Hey! Exactly, so we can increase the surface area but still fit it into your brain, into your skull. Good job. All right, the outer cortex of gray matter present in the cerebrum is composed primarily of, okay, so think, why is it gray? Oh, nope, white is myelinated. Okay, inner neurons and cell bodies are not myelinated. So they are gray. Everything that's myelinated is the white matter in your brain. So that's gonna be underneath the gray matter in the medulla, in the, in the white matter of your brain. All right. Okay, the brain contains some ventricles. How many ventricles does it have? 
How many fluid filled chambers? Good job. There are four ventricles. Two lateral and a third and a fourth. And that maybe that's why you, that threw you off for the person I picked three. Because there are three types, but there's two lateral ones. Okay. All right. Okay, hey, what of the brain is the location of our conscious mind? Where we are aware of everything going on. And then we can voluntarily respond. Yep, cerebral cortex. Cerebellum, that's our hand-eye coordination. But our cerebrum, our cerebral cortex, that's where the gray matter is. And so that's where we think, we do all of our thinking. That's the integration center where we think. Okay. Stimulation of the precentral gyrus would be more likely to cause contractions of the. Okay, so what that's saying, precentral gyrus is going to cause some contractions, but where more than anywhere else? Exactly, because we have more motor neurons going to our face and hands than any other parts of our body. Excellent. Sensory stimulation of which body area would be most likely to activate brain activity? In other words, where do we have the most sensory neurons? Good job in our lips and fingertips. Perfect. All right. Being left brain or right brain shows that the brain has you know, lateralization. <clears throat> so we have some parts of our left side of our brain doing some activities, right side of our brain doing some other activities. The right side of our brain can join the left side of our body, left side of our body being controlled by the right side of our brain. Did I say that right? I don't even know, but that's the idea. Okay, cerebral white matter between each hemisphere. So running from one hemisphere to the other is important for what? It's called the corpus callosum. So why do we have that corpus callosum? Yes, so we can communicate between the two hemispheres. Good. All right. Woo, oh, I got a little fist bump person. Yay. Okay, which brain rece region receives most sensory input before it sends it on to the cortex? Okay, so <clears throat> remember I told you all of the input comes to somewhere before it goes to the cortex. No, it goes to the thalamus, you guys. The hypothalamus is the autonomic stuff, but and it's going to take its own input and, and then deal with it on its own. It's not going to send it on to your, onto your cerebral cortex. It'll send it to the thalamus. And then the thalamus will send it to the cerebral cortex. So sensory input stops at the hypothalamus so that you can survive without thinking about it. But to be aware of the sensory input to go to the cortex, that has to go through the thalamus. Okay. All right. Okay, which brain region has a vital role in maintaining overall home <clears throat> body homeostasis? Yes, like I just said, it is the hypothalamus. Okay, so that's where all maintaining just our body homeostasis, making us stay alive, goes through the hypothalamus. Great. All right, which of, of the following brain regions, which if severely damaged would result in death? <clears throat> so which one is absolutely necessary there to make sure that we don't die?
It is the medulla oblongata because this is going to influence our heart rate and it's going to drive our breathing rate and um, a lot of stuff that our hypothalamus tells it what to do. So absolutely, medulla oblongata. All right. Professional ballet dancers have particular efficient function of which brain region? All that motor stuff, making sure you're in the right place at the right time. It is the cerebellum, it's that hand-eye coordination stuff. Good job. All right, which of the following brain systems is heavily involved in mediating emotional responses? So what system is, is gonna um, give you your emotional kinds of stuff? Phineas Gage kind of emotional stuff. It's your limbic system. This is your emotional part of your brain. Okay, so reticular formation is your sensory input with your reticular, reticular activating system, but your limbic system is the emotional. So anger, fear, sex drive, happiness, joy, all of that kind of stuff is going to be in the limbic system. All right. <clears throat> if inhibited, which brain system would then allow filtered stimuli to enter our consciousness? So all of our sensory input would come in. If this part of our brainstem wasn't functioning. <coughs> That's right, our reticular formation, okay? Because this the cerebrum is not our brainstem. So which brainstem part, that's the only part that's in our brainstem. Or I didn't say brainstem. That doesn't say brainstem, that says brain system. Sorry, I'm... But this is that is the function of the sorry you guys reticular formation is to filter the stimuli before it gets to the cerebrum. Oh heavens. Okay. All right, which of the following structures if damaged would produce less cerebrospinal fluid? In other words, what produces cerebrospinal fluid? It is our choroid plexus. Now we find fluid in our subarachnoid space, but these, but the PMO doesn't make it. It's just going to be flowing over the top of it, but it's the choroid plexus that makes it. All right. Okay, what root of the spinal cord controls muscle movement? Remember, we have two roots associated with our spinal cord. One is for sensory, one is for motor. All right, it is our ventral root. So we have a ventral root, we have a dorsal root. The ventral root is motor output, the dorsal root is sensory input. That's where the dorsal root ganglion of the unipolar neurons are, so, okay. Sarah's making a comeback. Okay, ascending tracks transmit what kind of impulses while descending tracks conduct what kind of impulses? So ascending tracks in the spinal cord versus descending tracks in the spinal cord. Very good. Ascending, sensory in, descending, motor out. Perfect. All right. What are stimulated when sound waves vibrate hair cells in the inner ear? So which ones are, which kind of receptors are, sound, are hair cells? They are mechanoreceptors. Okay. Nociceptors are pain stimuli. So it would have to be like super loud 
before those get. But we'll talk about that too in lecture is how come sound hurts sometimes. All right, not noticing movie theater popcorn smell after the movie has ended is called. You've been sitting in the movie for a long time and now you don't smell it anymore. How come? Yes, it is adaptation. Great job. And nobody moved. Everybody just got points. Of course, no one moved. All right, PNS neurons can regenerate while CNS neurons can't because oh, okay, so we need regeneration with Schwann cells. Okay, so um, Schwann cells are the ones that regenerate and um, um, oligodendrocytes do not. Okay. All right. Okay, which cranial nerve is the exception and travels to the thoracic and abdominal cavities? The vagus nerve, yep. The trochlear nerve just goes to one of the muscles in your eye. The vagus nerve just goes to the thoracic abdominal cavities. All right, spinal injuries can be simply detected by stimulating what to check for numbness? Oh no, dermatomes. That was what I was talking about yesterday with when they pinched my dermatomes and I couldn't feel it on my skin surface. But then the rest of me, the underneath of me was not, um, was not numb. And that's also how we're gonna test to see if you have injuries. If you have an area that you can't feel something from, then you probably have some spinal injury um, coming from that nerve that serves that dermatome. All right. Okay, yay, low fist bumper. Quickly lifting your foot and leg after stepping on a rock is an example of. Okay, now I know you wanted crust extensor, but I didn't put shifting to the other side. I, I know that was kind of a chintzy answer question there. So, because I know what you were thinking. Yeah, if I step on the rock and I lift it, now I'm doing withdrawal reflex, but then, so I should give you credit for, for that one too, crust extensor, because then you have to shift your leg to the other leg, which is what I told you all about. So yeah, I guess that's, that's probably not worded so good. Two, two good ch answers in there, but it won't be like that on a test, I promise. Okay, the length of a muscle is communi communicated to the brain via, so what are the little receptors in the muscle for stretch and letting you know um, how much your muscle is contracting or relaxing? Yes, it is us. Muscle spindle, good job redeem myself from that last question. All right, cross extensor, <laughs> there you go. Now we'll do cross extensor. So when is it important? Exactly, when you step barefoot on a sharp object so that you can shift your weight to the other side. All right, go little fist. Woo. Okay, which reflex helps protect muscles from stretching and tearing? So we're gonna have 
little receptors in our tendons that will make sure that it doesn't overextend. Okay, so in our tendons, in our joints, then we'll, we'll know um, how much is moving. But that's exactly what it says in our notes. Okay, oh, well, fist, beat the pineapple, woo! Okay, which of the following is not part of a spinal reflex arc? That's right, the cerebrum is not involved in a reflex, and that reminds me of, I was gonna post the decerebrate frog video. Oh, I will make sure I post that with this. Um, hey, good job. All right, which of the following is incorrect about spinal nerves? Hey, this, which is incorrect. Wait, that's not right. Which is this one, <laughs> this gold one right here. That was, I gotta fix that. Yeah, it's the gold one. They're either sensory or motor, but never mixed. No, they are always mixed. Sorry about that. That is a bad answer. I didn't key that right. Okay, I apologize. That's gonna mess up everybody's standings. Okay, which cranial nerve does not go to the eye? Oh, nope, trigeminal does because this is going to be the, the ophthalmic branch is when you get poked in the eye. The trigeminal lets you know, this is what you see with, this is move your eyeball around, this is what you feel your eyeball with, but this does nothing, okay? Doesn't move your eyeball, the trigeminal, but it just goes to your eyeball so you can feel it. All right. Which region of the spinal cord does not have a plexus? That's right, thoracic. We have cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral, but no thoracic plexus. All right. Okay, which cranial nerve is sensory only? Right, just for hearing and balance. This is both, vagus is mixed, hypoglossal is motor only, facial is mixed. All right, what is a ganglion? Yes, cluster of cell bodies outside of the CNS because all cell bodies are supposed to be in the gray matter of the CNS except for those motor neurons that are in ganglia or sensor neurons that are in ganglia too. All right, proprioceptors are receptors for Or our, oh goodness, no, okay. Nociceptors are pain, hearing are mechanoreceptors, touch are mechanoreceptors, but proprioceptors, like in with the muscle spindle, let us know where our muscles are so that we can then touch our nose with our eyes closed. They let us know where our muscles are in, in space, okay? So that's proprioception. 
Oh, nobody got anything on that one. That's right. <laughs> what is not found in the cerebral cortex? So what is not found in the gray matter? Oligodendrocytes are not found there because oligodendrocytes make things white. The axons are not in there if they're myelinated, so oligodendrocytes are not in the cerebral cortex, not in the gray matter. All right, what areas of the brain are necessary for understanding what is sensed? We call those areas. They are association areas. They associate input together to then send it to the motor output. That's why we call it association. All right, five more. What is the speech production center? Ah, I have an area named after me. Yes, it is Broca's area. Good job. Wernicke's is understanding speech. Broca's is production of speech. Oh, pineapple took the lead. Okay, our personality originates in which part of the brain? Think about Phineas Gage again. Yes, it is the frontal lobe, the very front of our frontal lobe. That's why back in the, well, I don't know, various times throughout society, um, even back in like the 30s and the, well, probably in the 30s, 20s and 30s, um, they still thought that we could treat someone with personality disorder by giving them what's known as a frontal lobotomy. So they would take an, a tool like an ice pick, go in, in the corner, the very corner of your eye and jam that in there, which would mess up, you know, to kind of scramble up the frontal lobe to make you have not have personality disorder anymore. And, but then it destroyed any ability that you had to have a personality after that. So frontal lobotomies are bad. All right. What type of cerebral white matter connects parts of the cerebral cortex in the same hemisphere? So we're connecting information on the same side of the brain. Those are association. Commissures are back and forth. So they're between hemispheres. Association fibers are within the same hemisphere. And projection fibers are up and down. And then a corpus callosum is a commissure. Okay. All right, which of the following is not controlled by the hypothalamus? So remember there were seven functions of the hypothalamus. Very good, because that's our cerebral cortex. That's our voluntary movement. All the rest of everything is involuntary with the hypothalamus. And our last question. Yay. Hiccuping, vomiting, vomiting, hiccuping, and sneezing are reflexes through what structure? Think of vom vomiting and hiccuping and stuff. What would be right? by that part of your body. It's your medulla oblongata, because it's right behind all your pharynx in your head, 
And so the reflexes, so the sensory input that causes you to hiccup, vomit, sneeze, all comes in to the medulla and goes right back out again. Okay, so let's take a look at them in third place, Thera. In second place, Fist. And in first place, Pineapple. Happy Pineapple upside down. Okay, and Camilla and the most shocked person are runners up. All right, so there is that. Leave and leave this and stop sharing. All right, so that's all I have for you today. So good luck on getting ready for your lab practical. I will have the list probably tomorrow of what you don't need to study. And, um, and then, so that's until next Tuesday, but then you have your test from tomorrow through Saturday to complete. So I wish you luck on everything and hope you have a great rest of your day until I see you um, tomorrow. Okay, have a great day, bye.